pass it over to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Kate Rader with the League of Women Voters, and I want to welcome our audience and tonight's speaker. Amit Prakash is a graduate of Oberlin College and Columbia University and is visiting assistant professor of global studies and co-assistant director of the first year seminar program at Middlebury College. He specializes in the history of colonialism, policing and immigration politics with a focus on France. Tonight he will describe how events and policies beyond our borders can influence policies and practices here at home. Amit. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here tonight. I wanted to thank uh, both Kate Rader and Michelle Singer for all the work they put in in organizing this, and also to the League of Women Voters for the invitation and the Kellogg Hubbard Library for, for hosting us. Um, so you might have noticed that uh, Policing is kind of in the news these days. Um, since the police murder of George Floyd in late May, what the New York Times has estimated to be the largest protest movement in American history has unfolded across the summer. Um, equally remarkable was the fact that there were a number of sympathy protests across the world that not only decried the death of George Floyd, but also protested police violence in their own communities. So two conclusions can be drawn from this. Uh, one is that American police violence and race relations are indeed globally scrutinized. Um, second, and perhaps more important for our purposes tonight, is that police violence is an issue that resonates globally uh, because it is experienced globally. So what, in essence, what we have is a global police rebellion um, or a global rebellion against what is supposed to be the legitimate power or uh, the legitimate coercive power of the state. And so I just want to pose the question, why is this the case, right? That this is supposed to be legitimate power, why? In order to answer this question, um, I want to start with another question. And so I'm going to share my screen um, and hopefully this will work. Everybody can see that? Yes. Thumbs up? Okay, great. So uh, the, the, the first question I'd like to sort of pose um, is what is the form of contemporary police power? Um, so how do we answer this, right? So if we wanna know why there's a global rebellion against police violence, I think we need to understand what is this contemporary form. So I want to do this first by just taking a short tour around the world. And we're hopscotching, to be sure, over many countries. Uh, but we just want to sort of glean a basic idea of what this current form is. So let's start with the United States. Um, Ferguson, 2014. Ferguson again. Florida in 2015, this uh, was initially taken by the sheriff of Richland County with a 50 caliber machine gun on it, which can cut a person in half with three rounds. Um, it's a very powerful weapon. Baton Rouge. And then this summer. Again, this summer. Brazil, this is in Rio, Bosnia, France, Hong Kong, Kashmir. So in general, and there's a couple more here, yes, Iraq, and then Israel. So what we can observe is that the modern police on a global scale are militarized. I think that's an, a fairly uh, safe uh, observation. 
uh, how so, what does it mean for them to be militarized? So some of the key features that scholars of police and police militarization, uh, which is a, a growing field really, uh, have discussed are, are, are these ones here. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through every single one of them, but I wanna talk about a few of them. Um, so one is materiel, it's the actual things, the stuff of the military that the police have in, inherited. So you saw in all those photos, that the materials of the military are on display. And in the US, a lot of this is coming from what's called the 1033 program. Uh, this is a provision of the 1997 National Defense Authorization Security Act, which created the law enforcement support program. And to date, what it, what it does is it basically takes the excess materiel from our various wars and redistributes these various weapons um, and technologies uh, and vehicles, many things, uh, to law enforcement uh, across the country. Uh, since 1997, $7.4 billion worth of weapons, uh, et cetera, have been distributed to over 11,000 departments. So that's one. Um, you've got the culture, you've got the sort of the, the posture, if you like, of the military. You've got the organizational form um, with the sort of military discipline. Uh, you've got the training and specifically what's important here is the American uh, style training, which has an outsized influence on other departments around the world, uh, precisely because America sends a lot of uh, police assistant trainers around the world. Warrior training is something that maybe some people have uh, heard about. The sort of premier instructor on this is a retired army colonel named David Grossman. He's the most uh, popular police trainer in the country. And the argument that he's basically making is that law enforcement in the American streets are exactly like warriors. Uh, they are effectively soldiers um, and are going, are operating in squads and going on patrols and that the neighborhoods that they patrol are sort of conceived of as battle spaces. Okay, so that's, that's one. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the 1033 program, you've also got a massive law enforcement and military connection with training itself. So not only do you have sort of these sort of private endeavors um, and entrepreneurs like, like David Grossman, but you've got actual active duty uh, military trainers coming in. Um, and what does this mean? Uh, one in military officer who trains police argued, and I'm quoting here, why serve an arrest warrant to some crack dealer with a 38? With full armor and the right shit and training, you can kick ass and have some fun. By the late 1990s, about 46% of all SWAT teams in the United States, and there are many of them, were regularly training with Army Rangers and Navy SEALs. And in another quote, um, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, one of the officers in the SWAT basically said that when they get this training, they have to use their own judgment because it usually ends up with the Navy SEAL saying, and this is when we bring in the artillery and, and blow everything to hell. Um, so, uh, here's another example of the sort of posture. Um, Urban Shield is an annual event held in San Francisco where police departments send their SWAT teams to engage in sort of SWAT competitions. Uh, and you can see that there's a sort of, you know, extremely militaristic ethos that celebrates violence here. Um, now, why, while I think all of this um, is sort of fundamental, sorry, I'm gonna go back here, sort of fundamental for understanding the contours of the contemporary form of police power. It remains purely descriptive. It's not really explanatory. Um, we can describe the features, but we don't quite know how we got here. So then let's ask a prior question, a more fundamental one. Why do we have the police? Buried underneath all that body armor and buried under all the hypermasculine bravado of SWAT team competitions is an answer. 
But for the police, these men of violence, and I stress men here, there's a sort of very masculine stress here, there would be chaos and anarchy. Every jurisdiction would be an anarchist jurisdiction, to quote the current attorney general. The influential uh, LAPD chief, William Parker, in the 1950s coined the phrase, the thin blue line, to describe this police role in shielding order from anarchy. And to most of us, this seems perfectly reasonable. A world without police seems unreasonable, seems unintelligible. Uh, therefore, in order to have order, one must have police. And this is completely plausible so long as you forget that for most of human history, what we call the police did not exist. In effect, what we have then in our modern assumption that the police are a prerequisite for order is a fetishism for police. Fetishism in the literal sense of the world, an irrational, extravagant fixation or devotion to something. So let's go back to our question of why do we have the police? What I wanna do is provide a very abbreviated uh, history of this concept of police and the institution of the police. Um, and I wanna start with that crucial distinction. While every society in history has had what we could call policing, some form of coercive behavioral regulation, not all societies have uh, or have had what we call the police. And there's a British uh, criminologist named Robert Reiner who has a useful definition here. Um, the police, a specialized body of people given primary formal responsibility for legitimate force to safeguard security, is a feature of relatively complex societies. That means societies with high division of labor. Um, the police have developed in particular with the rise of modern state forms. They have been, quote, domestic missionaries in the historical endeavors of centralized states to propagate and protect a dominant conception of peace and propriety throughout their territories. Uh, I probably should have highlighted that last line, the dominant conception of peace and propriety. Uh, it's, it's not universal, uh, it's, it's quite particular. Uh, so, Let's get started here. Um, the first thing to do is to trace how police, a concept, um, became an institution, became uh, the police. So our word police originates from the French Burgundian policy in the late 15th century. It also took other forms in Western and Central Europe at the time. And its basic meaning at that time meant good governance for good order. Police by the 17th and 18th century had a broader connect, uh, connotation of consolidating and promoting greater happiness in the aggregate for a given society. Police becomes the prerequisite to good order. And here we have two things. There's a sort of implied scope of police power, right? That the promotion of greater happiness is quite large and sort of undefined in its limits. Uh, and then there's the sort of semantic origins of police fetishism. The first is a key feature in the meaning of police because the reach of police power is vague and imprecise. The end may be the imposition of the dominant conception of order, but the means to achieve it are quite open. In one very influential police tract of 1757, it was argued that, quote, the objects which the police embraces are in some senses indefinite. A century later, a US Supreme Court ruling noted that police power is, quote, uh, is uh, and must be from its very nature in incapable of any very exact definition or limitation. Uh, therefore, a sort of capacious and perhaps uh, limitless power. These days, I would argue that power goes by the name of discretion, uh, which is quite broad. Now, second, if it is the case that an expansive view of police power emerged between the 15th and 18th centuries in Europe, we might ask why that was. How it came to be understood to be necessary for good order. And the short answer is the decline of feudalism. With the collapse of feudalism, there emerges in Europe, and this is a story that starts in Europe and then travels around the world, um, 
there emerges a new class of quote masterless men who are no longer bound to the land and supervised by their lords. Yet they are also mostly landless and by the 18th century will have had their lives and livelihoods upturned by the onset of the industrial revolution and the capitalist market economy. What was once a private enterprise, the reproduction of the social order via lordly supervision was now a public matter. In the United States, this anxiety about the poor would be mixed with racism and accelerated by the abolition of slavery. And I would argue that the entire project of the police or of police in general, um, and what comes to be the police is concerned with the management and administration of the poor that become a sort of social category, category of sort of anxiety uh, and great concern. Uh, the poor is the raison d'etre of the police. Now, speaking of the police, let's turn to a turning point in its institutional history. Um, so, in 1829, um, you've got the birth of the London Metropolitan Police at the urging of Sir Robert Peel. Um, Peel, between 1812 and 1816, had governed Ireland as chief secretary and created what he called the Peace Preservation Force. He believed this force of social control and English colonialism in Ireland would be useful in England itself. Why? England was, as you probably know, an innovator in industrialization and therefore had already created an immiserated industrial laboring class and out of work agricultural workers who flocked to cities and towns in hopes of work. The result was labor unrest and growing uh, calls for democratization of voting. Um, the Peterloo massacres already in uh, 1819. Um, ridding the electoral system of property requirements, even those, though those stay in some form until 1918 in England. And then also there's sort of embryonic forms of union organization. Thus the conception of order that Peel imagined was the protection of property from a sort of undeserving and unruly poor. Uh, the quote here is again from Peel, 300 men acting in concert, well armed and determined to resist to the utmost any attack upon property would do much good in places like Burnley and Blackburn. So what his conception of order also imagined was that property would be protected and the propertied would not be touched by this new police. The London Metro Police Scotland Yard um, still does not have jurisdiction over the city of London, the one square mile in the center of London that has historically and traditionally been the sort of the stomping grounds of the aristocracy and the wealthy. It's a, the current financial district. They have their own uh, internal police and uh, that's a sort of hangover from, from the origins of the London Metro Police. The other reason to focus on the London Metro Police is because they were extremely influential. Um, it becomes a model for the prefecture of police uh, in Paris that's already created by Napoleon in 1800, but the uniforms, the regular beats, uh, the weapons um, are all sort of appropriated and, and mimicked um, by the prefecture of police. Um, by 1838, the Boston Police Department is founded, modeling itself on the London Metro Police um, the Berlin Municipal Police, and then finally in 1845, the NYPD. All of these departments in turn become sort of international marquee departments and influence police practices in departments in small cities and towns across the world. So let's now move uh, to a different aspect of this story. So alongside of this European aspect of the story of why do we have the police um, is a parallel history of, of colonialism and colonial history. Policing was central to the entire colonial system and the maintenance of imperial domination. Uh, here was perhaps the most obvious example of the police being deployed to impose the dominant view of good order in social relations, which was often quite detached from what many colonized people believe what good order might look like. Um, 
what was different in the colonies, however, was that it was the military that did the work of the police for most of the colonial period. I'm speaking broadly here, there's, there's certain exceptions. Um, settler colonialism is a little bit different, um, but purely sort of ex exploitation and extraction colonies, this was certainly the case. Um, the, the reason for this is that most colonies were the products of military conquests and resulting military occupations, and only later did civil administration gain importance when in the 20th century there were pushes for decolonization. Uh, so the other major thing to note here is that colonies were very often the sites for experimentation with uh, tactics and strategies of rule um, and, and in particular uses of force. Uh, for example, in the British Empire, the army used what were called dum-dum bullets that exploded upon impact and their use was banned when fighting European adversaries, not so when fighting the so-called savages. Um, also in British India, you get the invention of fingerprinting for identification, initially for civil purposes, but then it's quickly repurposed for criminal identification. Uh, in French Algeria, there's the tactic of burning all of the grain, slaughtering all of the animals, uh, of the civilian population so that they could not provide any aid or to potential rebellion. They also engaged in the wholesale slaughter of populations themselves. Uh, and this was all sort of categorized under good, good uh, strong police methods or the other name was pacification. Um, as an example of this, this is during uh, the, in the throes of the French uh, conquest of Algeria, which began in 1830 and was very hard fought. Um, this is a French colonel um, sort of discussing what, what was required. All the populations that do not accept our conditions must be crushed. All must be taken and laid waste without distinction of neither age nor sex. The grass must no longer grow where the French army has set foot. This, my good friend, is how one must wage war against the Arabs. Kill all the men down to age 15, take all of their women and children, put them on boats and send them to the Marquesas Islands. to be pacified in the mother countries themselves. Um, in, it's usually the case that these are sort of racial, ethnic, or religious minorities. Uh, moving ahead, um, I wanna get to the 20th and 21st century. So uh, these historical sketches of the itinerary of police power is, I think, the necessary preamble to understanding the American situation. Um, and to tackle this, let's start with another version of American exceptionalism, uh, and which is the uniqueness of the police form uh, in America and its, and its unique history. Uh, there's these three sort of streams uh, that American policing came from, uh, and they're regional. Um, the Northeast, you have the sort of night watchman model, which is uh, imported from England. Uh, in the West or the Western frontier that's constantly moving, you've got the sort of Indian killer model, um, who's sort of bringing civilization to, to the savage world. Uh, and then in the South and in parts of the North, but certainly uh, mostly in the South, you've got the slave patrol, uh, which basically creates a, a sort of pass system for black people if they're on the move in the South, that they, that without a pass, they are subject to arrest um, by the slave patrol. So the U.S. police institution, I think, as it developed across the 19th century uh, and, and into the 20th, blends a bit of all three. Um, all three of these elements are kind of there um, in, in, in the sort of their fingerprints are sort of visible, I think. 
Um, so another thing that's quite important um, is the Cold War context uh, in, in the 20th century. Um, what this meant in practice, right, this, this idea of internal security of the U.S. being dependent on other countries' uh, internal security uh, was a vast system of overseas police training, funding, and assistance by an institution called the Office of Public Safety, which was housed within USAID, uh, but was staffed and peopled uh, by a many CIA agents um, and, and, and former police officers. Um, and so the generalization of the American style police institution became another metric of the relative sovereignty of a given state during the Cold War. And what that meant was that how, uh, to what extent was this state impervious to the overtures of, of communism uh, and or not really the overtures, the infiltration of communism. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is obviously coming from the perspective of the U.S. national security establishment. Um, the influence wasn't just one way, though. You know, the U.S. exploits abroad, uh, abroad influenced police trainers who then argued that some of the threats perceived uh, overseas could arise at home and could be adapted to home. So the sort of methods... Uh, could be grafted on to the local situation. So one thing I mentioned before is that one of the key points about police power is its imprecision. Um, and we've seen that this was articulated in various police treaties long ago. I, I, I cited just a couple. There's, uh, there's a steady drumbeat of those. Um, and it still has its uses. It's, the other thing is that that thinking has become fully institutionalized. I'll give you the example of the first inter-American conference of uniform police that took place in Peru in 1966. This was set up by the US Office of Public Safety. A Bolivian official there commenting on what he termed the American concept of police stated, quote, this concept states that police has no ascertainable limits. Everything that tends to promote public welfare is a matter of for the police, end quote. So uh, again, that sort of imprecision that was already there with the idea of producing uh, good order um, has lasted for centuries in various ways and has, and has really just sort of become part of the police institution. Um, the other thing that's important across the 20th century and, and, and into the 21st century uh, is the doctrine of counterinsurgency. Uh, and there's you know, a lot of ink spilled on, on this topic. Uh, effectively, what that doctrine, it's a military doctrine that argues that war fighting in the population, um, the war in the crowd, uh, is a much more difficult one, uh, and therefore there needs to be total information awareness about what the crowd is made up of, and the only way to do that is to fully police the crowd, the population. So the entire population, you know, is seen as being infiltrated by troublemakers, but the only way to sort of identify those troublemakers is to treat the entire population as suspect. Um, and this um, becomes a sort of standard approach for, for policing minority and poor populations in America and across the world. Um, and it's seen as sort of best practices, I think, is, is, is the other sort of major point. Okay. Now, before concluding, um, I'd like to offer... Um, Maybe it's idiosyncratic, but, but, but I think it works, uh, which is an example of tear gas as what I find to be a potent symbol of contemporary police power. Um, it's a potent symbol, not only because it's ubiquitously used according to its billing as a quote, non-lethal riot control agent, 
but because its continued use by domestic police forces around the world is a material trace of the global history of police. So, but before we get to that, you know, very briefly, what is it and what does it do? Um, it usually takes three different forms. Um, these are abbreviations of its chemical compound names, CN, GAS, CS, and CR. Uh, pepper spray, which is, goes under OC, uh, also falls under this umbrella of lacrimatory agents. Uh, in Latin, lacrima means tear. Um, it's, most people who write about it say it's not quite a gas, it's more of a moisture that sticks to everything. Um, it is supposed to be physically debilitating and also to cause psychological terror. Uh, it works by attacking the mucous membranes, the rep respiratory system, and causes blurred vision, excessive tearing, the burning of the nostrils and mouth, um, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and stimulates um, pain, pain receivers. Uh, it was developed and used in World War I. And this is the, the purpose here was to get enemies out of the trenches so that they could be visible for artillery and machine gun fire. Um, and it's been used on countless other battlefields, but has been technically banned since the Gene Geneva Protocol of 1925 and has been banned again. That ban was reaffirmed by the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, the U.S. right after World War I created a Department of Chemical Warfare um, and the leader, Amos Fries, um, was a big promoter of, of tear gas um, and there was a big profile done on him uh, in the Gas Age Record, which was a trade magazine in 1921, and this is the description, it said that Fries, quote, has given much study to the question of the use of gas and smokes in dealing with mobs as well as with savages, and is firmly convinced that as soon as officers of the law and colonial administrators have familiarized themselves with the gas as a means of maintaining order and power, there will be such a diminution of violent social disorders and savage uprising as to amount to their disappearance. 40 years later, an American security expert in 1963 uh, sort of doubled down on this and said, quote, the best way for the free world to guard freedom in Southeast Asia is to make use of chemical warfare weapons. So by the late 1960s, tear gas had become the chemical weapon of choice used by police forces um, in Chicago in, and in Paris in 1968, in Berkeley, California, and Derry in Northern Ireland in 1969. And the expanded use uh, was partially due to a growing industry that was connected to police departments and were run by former military veterans or police officers. Um, the, one of the most important ones was the Lake Erie Chemical, which was uh, founded by World War, American World War I veteran. Um, and here you can see here that they're, they're hawking CS rather than CN gas uh, because it's uh, more potent. Um, CN may stop here, CS keeps them running home. Um, Lake Erie Chemical was one of the largest tear gas manufacturers. Uh, and the veteran who founded it thought that tear gas could be useful to police and also commercially successful at home. And he was right. Um, in addition to the commercial impulse, there was also the influence of the Vietnam War on American policing at home. Um, in California, a 39-year-old police inspector named Daryl Gates, who had experienced the riots in Watts in 1965, noted that the police, quote, did not know how to handle guerrilla warfare. And by 1968, working with Marines at Fort Pendleton outside of San Diego, he created the first special weapons and tactics team. Um, he, he wanted to call them actually initially the special weapons assault teams, but um, uh, his underlings thought that was a bit too uh, warlike. So the special weapons and tactics as it was, better known as SWAT. 
Um, so tear gas, as well as other chemical weapons, were also heavily used in Vietnam. So there's this sort of knowledge being produced by the Vietnam War that's being um, integrated into American policing as well. And so what we have with tear gas is an artifact of police power and a symbol of its contemporary operation. Uh, it has escaped the battlefield and is ubiquitous in the streets. Once deployed, it's, it is indiscriminate in who it harms as an entire region or group is deemed sort of suspect and deserving. How much tear gas is used and how, man, how many injuries are caused by it? Nobody knows. There's no mandatory accounting of the damage it causes. There's also no legal requirement to track its sale, export, or its environmental damage. It's a military weapon that has slipped from the battlefield where it is banned by the laws of war, but falls with well within the discretionary power of the police. So to conclude, um, a few things that we can say is that there are similarities in contemporary forms of police power due to this increased international collaboration, but mostly because there are certain uh, Western police departments that have had outsized influence on what uh, a professional police force is supposed to look like and what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to deal with threats, uh, the, the types of force it's supposed to use, the type of weaponry it's supposed to be equipped with. Uh, second, that if we want to understand the militarization of the police in America, there is an American story to this, that's true, but there is also a global story to this that is crucial, and you're, I would argue, you're sort of leaving a lot out uh, to just focus on the more provincial story. Um, it's a story about in European history, colonial history, Cold War conflicts, contemporarily Palestine is acting as uh, that sort of experimental site for security innovation. Um, and then also American cities. I'll just note that, you know, the NYPD, which is one of the most influential departments in the world and certainly in America, uh, trains with the Israeli Defense Forces in Palestine every single year. Um, and then finally, we can note that contemporary police power retains these traces of its past in the sort of ideological views and postures, the practices, and certainly in the very material that it uses to practice uh, its profession. Okay, uh, so I'm going to stop my screen sharing and get back. Thank you very much. Okay, so I guess we're, we're in Q&A now. Um, and so there are a few questions in the right, so Okay, so Kate asks the question, does the military culture of police attract a particular type of recruit um, uh, who's drawn to policing? Uh, so, so one thing to think what, I think one thing that's interesting about policing um, is that because it's one of the few uh, unions in the country that sort of does well by its members and is quite powerful. Uh, so in terms of achieving a middle class um, lifestyle with a guaranteed requirement, with a high degree of job protection, um, with great benefits that are permanent, um, uh, this is, it's one of the few professions left really um, that allows for this. Uh, so what I think we can say, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into the sort of authoritarian personality argument when I know there's a sort of psychological argument out there that there's, there's, there's certain 
um, psychological features that people uh, exhibit that draw them to wanting to be um, part of uh, a coercive mechanism. Um, I, I would say that socially, um, there's two things at work. If you find yourself, interestingly enough, to be a poor person, the police is a good way to go to have some social mobility. That's, it's, it's, it's a pretty solid job to get. Um, the other thing that we can also see is that um, there's a sort of tradition in policing um, that often, what's often the case is that children of police officers become police officers. Uh, so there's a sort of generational uh, continuity. So, Kate, I'm totally going to punt on that um, question of, of if, if there's a psychological profile um, to, to a sort of archetypical police person. Um, but I think there are sociological factors, if I can put it that way, that can sort of help explain um, why recruitment. And so I, I'll speak about where I live for a while, which is in New York, why Staten Island is filled with police. Um, they're... they're, they're there's a, there is a sort of generational tradition there um, uh, and, uh, and, and also a sort of guaranteed uh, provisions that older 1950s, 1960s working class jobs can provide that police can provide now. Uh, so we've got a number of questions. Uh, Tom McCone, how widely militarized are the Vermont police? So I teach a course at Middlebury College called Policing the Globe. And in, usually it's taught in the J term. And one of the things that my students do, I let them, they can write a paper if they want, but they can also do podcasts. And, and what I've learned from their podcasts through their research is they, they went and talked to the state police, the, the county sheriffs and so on. And they are quite militarized, um, that they are, they, they are well aware of the 1033 program. They use the 1033 program. Um, they've been offered things by the 1033 program that they've turned down. Um, the uh, Addison County Sheriff turned down a whole batch of bayonets, for instance, right? That I don't know why you would need a bunch of bayonets in Vermont, but, but um, he also, also understood that. They also turned down a gunboat, um, which I guess you'd put in Otter Creek or something, but, but I, I, I'm not quite sure where, where that would be used. Other things that are used, however, are surveillance drones, um, um, M16 rifles, uh, body armor, concussion grenades, tear gas, um, and in some cases, uh, not all over Vermont, but in some cases there's a few uh, MRAPs. Um, which are these uh, mine-resistant armored personnel carriers, uh, which were created um, or souped up, really, during the Iraq War. I mean, that's one of the things is that, you know, that we have tank depots in Nevada where there's, you know, thousands of tanks that just sit lying there, you know, created for what was thought to be the great tank battle in Central Europe against the Soviet Union, which never happened. And so the, the military, through its wars over time, has this excess. And, and the 1033 program was created to sort of distribute that excess, to sort of offload some of the maintenance costs of keeping all that stuff. Um, but they also don't track it very well, right? So there's been a lot of um, congressional hearings about the people who are managing that program and they don't, they know they give it away, but they don't quite track where it goes. Uh, so this, this stuff is, is going everywhere. Um, right. Let's see here. There's some more questions. Okay. If the use of tear gas was banned via the Geneva protocol and that ban was reaffirmed, why then would the hegemonic power of the U.S. allow its police to use said chemical on its own citizens? So one of the, one of the uh, dirty secrets of that Geneva protocol is that the United States reserved the right to use tear gas not on battlefields, but for riot control in domestic situations. Um, and and so that's where, you know, this is sort of grand irony, right? Is that it's, it's, it's a chemical weapon that's banned by war, but it's, you know, 
2020 is the year of tear gas, right? I mean, it, we see tear gas every, the year before that would be 2011 during uh, the Arab Spring. Um, but but uh, certainly, certainly this year, this, this, there's a lot, and, and again, we don't know exactly how much because uh, there's no tracking mechanism. There's no mandate to track. Um, what happened to, Elizabeth Bernstein's asking, what happened to the night watchman part of policing? I think that, you know, I, I see, it, it's weird, it's a weird mix, right? You know, people like George Zimmerman become the sort of night watchman type. They were sort of self-deputized, uh, and then Trayvon Martin becomes the frontier. Right, that 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 this is this is uh, confronted with with um, moving boundaries now that, that that the actual frontier is 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 has been met. Um, there are these other sort of threats that are sort of produced. Um, that model, I think, has also become militarized. To be quite frank, you know, it's it's a, one way that that police departments around the world get to use their gear more often is to put it, do it, reserve it, or not purely reserve it, but it's more reserved for uh, night police units that only go out at night. Um, hence, they have the infrared goggles, they have, they have, again, they have all of the stuff uh, that you would maybe need um, for, or perceive that you need. Uh, for nighttime war fighting, which which um, is policing. Uh, Murphy Robinson, are there any examples of modern countries who don't police in this way, or don't police at all, and this works well for them? So I'll I'll give the example. Um, of if you ever watch like a British crime show, you know they they'll they'll freak you out by saying armed police showed up, right? Because usually the police aren't armed there, right? Like armed police, things got serious. Um, and one statistic, and the statistics, you know, can lie and so on, but, but one thing that's telling is that since 1900, the British police, and we're not talking about the Royal Irish Constabulary in, in, in Northern Ireland and so on, but, but British police within the British Isles, and, and again, Northern Ireland separate, have since 1900 have killed 50 people, right? That 50 people have been killed. The US police on average kill a thousand people a year, which is about three a day, right? So that um, difference right there shows you that there isn't an arms race on the streets in the same way as there is in the United States. Um, and that's perhaps one of the greatest challenges for demilitarizing the police should you want to, uh, is that there's, there's as many weapons as there are people, um, legal weapons, uh, firearms in circulation in this country, um, and high powered ones too. And so the police kind of have a very strong argument as to why they need these weapons, because there are a lot of other people with a lot of very powerful weapons and body armor and so on and all of these things. Um, the statistics once again shows show you that it's very rare uh, that those sorts of confrontations ever come to pass, and these sort of militarized police expeditions are now what were sort of created for urban warfare against rioting are now used to do low level drug warrants um, uh, with all sorts of terrible consequences um, to to the communities involved. Um, Chris Spencer, uh, is police oversight and citizen review board effective? Uh, I guess it, the answer would be it depends, right? It depends on do they have teeth, right? Do they have a purely advisory role? Um, can they only sort of shame, um, but uh, not really do anything? Can, can, um, to what extent are those boards themselves? Uh, staffed by police officers. That's often the case, 
right? I know in Vermont that's a thing that 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 there 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 is a whole controversy around uh, um, police reform in Vermont, where one of the 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 items on the docket is that should there be or how much representation should there be of police on a review board um, and 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 the police their argument is that well we know our profession the best we should have some representation um, we know uh, what needs what looks sort of kosher and and, and not um, whereas people who critique that are basically arguing that that becomes a way for to defang really um, a, a review board by by having it populated by police in, in, in any form. So I think it sort of depends. I, I think it it's not a bad idea. It's better than nothing. Um, that's that's true. Um, but it, it it really matters of whether it's a paper tiger or not. Um, is there so Ellen and and uh, um, similar questions, so I'll synthesize them. Is there anyone working at a high level in the US to demilitarize the police? In this administration, no, um, certainly not. Um, the Obama administration did do certain things to wind down a little bit of the 1033 program. In other cases, it did a lot more to ramp them up, particularly with border policing. Um, so you get increased militarization of the policing of borders under Obama um, that starts you know with Clinton and is sort of ramped up by the Bush administration and and the Obama administration uh, really um, accelerates it um, but uh, this administration is it, uh, turned back the clock on all of the the 1033 program limitations so that's that's back in full effect um, what would demilitarizing the police look like? Uh, so you saw all that materiel, right? I mean, the, 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 the question is that are those things needed, right? And, and, it, and it sort of begs the question, the sort of more fundamental question that I started with is that why do we have the police, right? That, that is it the case that all our towns and cities are effectively just we're, we're their war zones, right? That 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 we are constantly there's a sort of ambient state of violence in this country that requires heavily armed police to be patrolling at all times and to approach every sort of infraction, um, not with a hammer but uh, with a machine gun, right? That that that's. And the answer overwhelmingly has been yes, so far, right? I, I think it's a sort of, there's not a lot of political will uh, around demilitarization. I think one of the things, if, you, if we talk, if we think about, okay, these are the features of militarization that we talked about earlier, um, these various characteristics, the training, the stuff, all that. If that's what militarization looks like, demilitarization could look like taking away some of those things. Right, it would be a start. That would be that would be something one could do. Um, is there the political will to do that? Uh, is an entirely separate question, I think. Um, uh, are there examples of police collaborating successfully with social workers or mental health workers? So this is one of the things that uh, the new administration has argued for. Right, that rather, and, and I'm a bit critical of this, the, the, the argument that Joe Biden has made is that there should be more police reform and therefore more money for police training. And I, I would just say that if you look at the history of police training, um, they've been trained a long time not to choke people, not to racially profile. Um, there's been a lot of training that's been going on for decades. And somehow that money is used to sort of showcase we've done this training, we had some sort some PowerPoint that we were shown, uh, and that and that money is then sort of siphoned in different places, and often it's it's into sort of more coercive force. Um, I would say that rather than investing more money 
in bringing police and teaching them how to work with social workers, maybe invest more money in social workers, um, that, that that is the sort of area of investment that also kind of leads to demilitarization. I'm sure you've heard this, this term defund the police, right? What, is, what, what, what does that mean? Um, what that means is it, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily no police anymore, but that it, it ultimately narrows their purview. It narrows the ambit of their activity. Uh, that every problem in our society is not a problem for the police. Um, and so defunding doesn't mean you, it's defunding and you do nothing with that money, but you reallocate that money um, in different places. And, and there is an argument to be made, and the police often make this argument, is that, that um, underserved communities face a lot of crime and they often call for more policing. But what's often left out is that they also call for better jobs, better healthcare, better education, um, all of these things. And those things are, are often very lacking, but the, but the police solution seems to be not lacking. Um, so that's where I think if we wanna talk about reform, um, it, that's where some success may lie. Um, but marrying a SWAT team with a social worker, I don't think is, is going to be, you're not really, what that social worker will end up doing is acting as cover for the doings of the SWAT team. Um, it, it becomes a, a sort of alibi uh, for the continued policing of ever more sectors of society. Um, do you fear, does fear concern of safety play a role in militarizing police? I, I think it plays a role in the discourse, right? That, that's, that's the only rationale, right? What other rationale could you have but for fear, right? And that's the argument of, of the police is that if you don't have the police, um, it's, yeah, it's a war of all against all. Right, that uh, that that becomes the sort of uh, the threat of of, of anarchy. Um, you know, William Barr is a good testament to this. Right, that that this 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 type of discourse is 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 there. Um, and of course, it's not. I mean, this is this is the hard thing, right, to thread with American society, which is that there are a lot of guns. There's a lot of weapons, um, and. This is a violent society. There's a lot of there's a lot of murders in this country, uh, way more so proportionally than other countries that are not uh, at like civil war. Um, so those things are very real, uh, and it might well be the case in those narrow circumstances that police could be deployed. Um, but for somebody wandering in the street with a mental health crisis, uh, for panhandling. Um, for, for truancy, um, uh, the, the, the deploying of the police, um, is, a, is a uniquely American thing, actually, right? that, that the extent to which we use, uh, the police is, is, is quite extraordinary. Um, Alan Lewis asked, are there any particular books on this issue that you recommend or am I writing one? I, I'm writing a book. I just finished a manuscript on the policing of North Africans um, in Paris. Uh, and uh, they, the, the prefecture of police there had, they were, although the French like to sort of argue it's the Americans that are the racists because they've had, you know, they had, you know, racialized slavery and so on, somehow forgetting about their own colonies. Um, but they argue that they, there's a sort of universal treatment of the French citizen is the sort of myth. But with policing, it's a very different story because they had openly explicit North African brigades, right? So what we would call racial profiling, they fully institutionalized. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book on that. So it's a little bit different, but it's, there's a lot of the story of colonial history and the intersection of militarized policing there. I think the, Two books um, fairly, that came out fairly recently that I would recommend. Um, one is a very easy read. Uh, it's short, uh, but it's useful, is Alex Vitale's uh, The End of Policing. 
Uh, and that's American centric. There's some chapters on, on international policing and things like that. Um, but it's, it's very approachable for the general reader. Um, and I think, and what's really useful about his book is that not only, and he's a radical critic of, of policing, um, but he, in addition to offering the critique, in every chapter he quite literally offers paths forward, other things that one could do, right? That this is what you're doing and these are some of the effects, why don't you try this? Uh, so I think that's a great book. Another book um, that just came out last year is a book by Stuart Schrader um, called Badges Without Borders. And I think the subtitle is How Global Insurgency Transformed American Policing. Um, and he's a uh, sociologist uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, that's a much more dense read, um, very academic book. Um, but it's, it's going to be, um, I think, a, a classic um, and a foundational book in 20th century studies of, of American policing. Um, so that's another one I would, I would, I would, I would highly recommend. It's, it's, it's very good. It's very good. But it's not beach reading. Um, okay. Um, what can average citizens do to be involved with policing in their community? That is a big question. I don't know, quite frankly. Um, this is, you know, at the, one thing that's been interesting for me, at least with this national election, is that because it's forced all of us to pay more attention to politics, I'm paying much more attention to local politics as well. Uh, and policing happens at the local level. Um, and so as much as you know, we can, there should be a focus on national programs and things like that, that's important. But actual transformation of how policing operates really comes down to who's, if you're voting for sheriffs, who your sheriff is, um, the towns council members, how much money they're allocating for you know, in their budgets and so on. So it really is a sort of local issue and it's very granular, uh, which makes it completely boring and unsexy. Um, but, but in terms of actually affecting change, that's where uh, the rubber meets the road. You know, local prosecutors, things like that. Um, those things really matter. Okay. Other questions that maybe I've missed. Uh, Leela Richardson, what do you make of Article 5 of the Vermont Constitution, quote, that the people of this state by their legal representatives have the sole inherent and exclusive right of governing and regulating uh, the internal police of the same. What's its uh, relevance today, right? So, well, that's true, right? That, that the Vermont State Police are the sort of, you know, marquee institution in, in Vermont. Um, they, they are uh, extremely important, but this is kind of, you know, I think it's an effect of how professionalization works, right? How influence moves um, around societies is that, yes, there is uh, technical sort of sovereignty in that sense over the internal policing of Vermont. Um, but then, you know, the, the Vermont police want to look like other police that are considered to be the, the best police departments. Um, so there is a sort of fashion system, if you like, at work where there is sort of, there's this um, uh, imitation, at least. The other thing, of course, to remember is that, um, as we know, Vermont is a border state, uh, which means if we think about um, the border patrol, they have a hundred mile radius that is their jurisdiction um, around the country um, or on the border. So, and, and ICE can go wherever they like. Um, so those are, there's sort of multiple forms of police that then sort of countermand um, the would-be um, impenetrable sovereignty of internal policing in Vermont. Uh, 
Okay. Um, Elizabeth Corker, why do you think it's mainly the, the youth that have been involved in shedding light on this issue in terms of protest? Why haven't the older generations been involved more? It is the case that certainly in the United States, and I think this would probably be the case in other countries, certainly in France, I can speak to that. Um, it is younger people who, and usually men, it's gendered as well, um, that are more frequently stopped by them. They have more police encounters. Um, so, and, and of course, America being America, there's a racial order to that as well, right? So that, um, uh, that's, that's certainly the case. Uh, I've, this summer, you know, the protest movement this summer of what is projected to be between 15 million and 25 million people, was largely youth, but it was also multi-generational. Um, I thought, you know, there's, there's a lot of different sort of voices out there, which made it very different from when the movement emerged after the murder of Trayvon Martin, right? So that where, where it was more sort of niche, if you like. Um, but that's, I think that's a big shift, right? That is, that is, that is a very big shift. Uh, for people interested in police de demilitarization, you can sort of capitalize on that political will, right? Because you know that there is there is some political will, right? Whereas uh, before, even the idea of you know cutting police budgets at all would have been sort of laughed out of the room. Um, you know, at least some, you know, modifications to to police budgets are now. Uh, on the table. Um, Keith Gosland, to um, what is the percentage of current police officers who have come out of the military so they're bringing their training as an active part of their police response? Uh, something like fifteen to twenty-five percent um, is a broad figure, and and it's and it's very different depending on the region that you're in. Um, um, that said, many police officers get military training. Um, so they get military, they, either they get military training from actual military trainers, or they get this sort of warrior training um, um, from people like uh, David Grossman. It's been banned in some, in some departments now. Uh, so in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, it was banned after the killing of Philando Castile because David Grossman had trained that in, entire department. Um, um, but the police union balked and then paid for it privately too. So it's so it still can continue, continues in, in, in other forms. Um, so, and you can't sort of stop that if the union's willing to pay for it. Um, so the, the, the other sort of ways in which the sort of militarized training sort of comes back, um, they're the most sort of, I don't know, um, important example of this was, it was a, a, a Marine named Mike Couton who came back from Afghanistan and joined the Springfield, Massachusetts Police Department. Um, and he, and basically he argued that the counterinsurgency manual that was being used by the police, by the military in Afghanistan could be used in Springfield to deal with, uh, gang problems. Um, and he created this counterinsurgency continuum policing, which he's now branded as continuum policing three or something like that. And sort of sells to different departments around the country. Um, and that's become fully integrated, right? That's, 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 that's become fully integrated. I um, mean, so there's, there's a very sort of direct line, you know, from Afghanistan to Massachusetts um, and the integration of the, of the, of the practices. Um, and that's just one example. There's, 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 there's many more. Um, other questions. Okay, I th think I've answered most of them. Um, I think that's I think 
believe, are there any other questions? No, okay. All right, Kate and Michelle, are we? Yeah, thank you, Amit. That's really generous of you to um, kind of offer your wide knowledge of this to, to answer all these questions. Yes, this is this is Kate. Thank thank you because I think you're giving us a really good context for the rest of our series. The next one on January 13 will discuss policing during mental health crises. So I do that, that for a couple of questions about that. So I think that that we're off to a good start. Um, it's the mission of the League of Women Voters to empower voters and defend democracy. And we hope that this series advances that mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you.